Well, good morning. It's good to see you guys here today. Everybody here in Maribel with me, everybody in Knoxville. Glad you guys are connecting. And of course, everybody online as well. I'm super excited about this Friday, which is Jingle Jam. And so if you've got kids, you are not going to want to miss this. If you've got grandkids, bring them. It's a perfect event to be able to invite your family and friends who maybe aren't going to church anywhere to come and be a part of a really fun, engaging experience. And then hopefully we'll see what the Lord does with that in the future, connecting them uh, to his gospel. And so I encourage you guys to be a part of that. That is this Friday. If you've got a Bible, let's turn to Luke chapter one. We are starting a brand new series today uh, entitled Christmas Without. Um, let me start with this. When it comes to Christmas, there are many, many, many traditions that make Christmas special, right? Uh, I love the traditions around Christmas that our family's a part of, and, and I'm sure you do as well. For some of you, um, it, it's going to be the, the, the lights and the decorations, right? Since Thanksgiving or maybe before Thanksgiving, uh, you've had your decorations up and lights and all that kind of stuff, and that just kind of makes it special. For some of you, it's the Christmas tree um, and, and, and making that feel special. Some of you uh, love the the Christmas cookie deal or the gingerbread deal. I personally am a fan of the cookies, right? Uh, we do that in our house as well. For some of you, it's the music, right? Christmas music is playing in your car. How many of you are like, Christmas music is my jam? I love it, right? All over, good. Uh, for some of you, it's the movies because we return to the same Christmas classics, right? How many of you are big movie fans? And so, you know, um, you've got all of the, all the classes, Christmas vacation, right? Uh, it's a Wonderful Life, you got to go back to that one. Die Hard, you got to go back to that one. <laughs> what? It's a Christmas movie, right? Come on. All these things. And if you're a kid, obviously it's the gifts. That's the best part. Like, that's the best part for kids and the tradition of getting the good gifts. And if you're a parent, it's just like, let's get together with my family. That's the biggest part for for adults, really, because it's really a Christmas miracle to be able to have your entire family in the room. Like if that actually happens, uh, that's a miracle in and of itself. And so when you, when you think about all the traditions, all of these things really make Christmas special. But, but you know, the, the reality is n really none of the uh, traditions that we hold dear have really anything to do with remembering the birth of Jesus I mean, when you do research and you begin to kind of dig into the lights, the trees and Santa Claus and all this kind of stuff, that's nothing to do with the Bible. In fact, Jesus never told us to remember his birth. In fact, we don't even know when Jesus was actually born. Historians are a little fuzzy on this, but uh, Christians in the Roman Empire started to observe Jesus's birth on December 25th in roughly the late 200s, uh, 221 uh, uh, roughly. Uh, well, what's also interesting is that Christians in Egypt and uh, also Christians that were in Asian Minor believe that Jesus was born on January 6th. So early Christians were kind of celebrating those dates as, as Jesus's birth. They have reasons for that and kind of dates leading back. And, you know, all of that's kind of uh, up in the air theories. We don't really know for sure. And, and, and the reality is, uh, we don't really know. Um, December 25th kind of took over because Rome was kind of in charge of everything at that time. And, and um, that there was a, a, a pagan festival taking place on December 25th that, that people were observing because that's the winter solstice, you know, um, days get longer, summer, spring is on the way, right? So that kind of celebration happened on that date. And so the Roman Catholic Church was like, well, let's just kind of absorb that and let everybody kind of keep celebrating. We'll just kind of throw, make it about Jesus instead of, you know, the winter solstice and it kind of worked. Over the years, that's kind of what Christians began uh, to do. But the truth is we don't know, and it's okay that we don't know when Jesus was actually born. What does matter is that he was born, right? Over the years in our culture, business leaders, entrepreneurs, marketers started to take the um, celebration of Jesus's birth in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and started to take advantage of that and, and began to, to market things like Santa Claus and giving gifts and buying things and filling stockings and all of these kinds of traditions that began to fill this time of year that, that we love today. And so today, most of what we call Christmas really has nothing to do with remembering Jesus. Now, traditions are not wrong in and of themselves, However, they become wrong 
when they take the place of Jesus, when our focus and our attention and our time is placed on an idol or something else instead of who Jesus is and what this means. And so I don't want you to fall for the lie of our culture and what it has become. Uh, the, the, the lie that the real magic of Christmas is a, a fat guy in a red suit and, and elves and decorations. The real magic of Christmas isn't magic at all. It's a miracle that took place. And I think what makes Christmas really so special and, and, and means so much to us is because of really three things. The first thing is because we actually become more intentional about being with the people that we love. We're way more intentional about gathering with our family at this time, more so than any other day in the year. At the same time, we also get at least one day off of work. So that helps and puts us in a good mood maybe a week or even longer than that. And so you take, okay, I've got time away from the office. I'm more intentional about being with family. And then the third reason I think is that we take this one day and we imitate Jesus more on this day than on any other day out of the year. Think about the amount of time and, and, and that you're sacrificing and money that you're sacrificing to give gifts and to provide food uh, for the people that you love. And so on this one day, we bless our family, we bless our kids, we, we are generous with our kids and, and we see their grateful faces. And when they open up presents, especially younger kids, and they're so excited, like we get a glimpse of, of, of happiness, even when things are not going great in our own life. For that one moment, we experience the joy of giving. And folks, that's it. Because when we are giving, we are more like Jesus. We're never more like God than when we are generous and we're giving. And, and so you couple all of those three things together and it's just a special time for us. But you can celebrate Christmas without the presents, without the elves, but you can't celebrate Christmas without Jesus. In this series, I wanna help you focus on what really matters this Christmas season. Some of you are trying to celebrate Christmas without Jesus and you're, you're not happy. Some of you are trying to run a business without Jesus and you're frustrated. Some of you are trying to raise a family without Jesus and you feel empty and hopeless. And I wanna encourage you in this series to run to Jesus, worship Jesus in the midst of the tradition, we keep him as our focus. And to do that today, I want us to turn to Luke chapter one. This is the story of the angel coming to Mary and actually telling her what is about to happen. And we're gonna do a deep dive into who Jesus actually is today. And so we'll start verse 26. Um, in, the sixth month of, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, I will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, John the Baptist. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. Another miracle taking place. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Several things we learn about who this baby, this child is actually going to be. In verse 31, the angel says, you're gonna call his name Jesus. Now the Hebrew word for the name Jesus is Yeshua. When you transliterate, transliterate that word into English, it's Joshua, but we, we call his name Jesus. Where does that come from? Well, the Greek uh, uh, version, so the New Testament is written in the Greek language. And so the, the Greek name here is Jesus, right? 
this I-E, Seuss. So when you translate the Greek name, Isus, into English, you get Jesus, right? And so that's kind of where we get the, the, the name. And, and, and I know if you, you know, depending on your algorithms, you're going to find people talking about this and saying, we're using the wrong name and getting all upset and stuff. And, and so what the scripture teaches us is that the name of Jesus is, is important because of the meaning and of whom it represents, So it's not about the pronunciation of the word because all over the world, the name Jesus is pronunciated differently. In Italian, it's Gesù Christo. In Russian, it's Lisos Christos. In Spanish, it's Jesu Christo. And in East Tennessee, it's Jesus Christ. (laughs) Just gotta get it real slow there. Just gotta deep voice it there. Jesus Christ. The pronunciation of the word does not affect the meaning of the word. Jesus is his name. Uh, The Bible nowhere commands us to only speak or write his name in Hebrew or speak his name in Greek. That is not the case. You will call his name Yeshua. And in English, we pronounce his name Jesus. In verse 32, it talks about his position, like his authority. The angel said he will be great. He will be the son of the most high. Of course, the most high refers to God, meaning that he is going to have the very nature of God. He will be in the line of David, meaning that he would be in the lineage of King David. And so David, um, uh, Joseph being of the line of David was important because in 2 Samuel 7, the Old Testament scripture predicts that the Messiah would be the great, 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 great grandson of King David, David and Goliath, David. And so Everyone knew that if this was the Messiah, then he had to be a descendant in the line of King David. And so this speaks directly to that. That's why the Gospel of Matthew, who is specifically writing to the Jewish community at that time, in chapter one of Matthew is a genealogy of Jesus. And you read that sometimes and you think, oh man, this is the boring part. So-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so. Why is this important? Well, it's showing and teaching us the validity that Jesus is the Messiah in the line of David. So we, we see that uh, this is in the line of David. We also see that this is an eternal throne. His line, his kingdom will have no end. Again, it speaks to his deity. In verse 35, it says this is going to be a miraculous birth. Mary says, I'm a virgin. How is this going to be? So this is going to be a miraculous birth. Why is it important that Jesus is born of a virgin? We'll see in just a moment, but the virgin birth meant that Jesus didn't inherit his father's sin nature. He did not experience and inherit original sin. And that's why we use the the, the term Emmanuel, God with us. His father is God the father. So what we're seeing in these texts is something very deep and important. And that is the reality that Jesus is fully God and he's fully man in one person. He's fully man and he is fully God in one person. Now, being fully human means that he had a human body. And so he had to eat and drink just like we do to stay alive. He got tired and so he had to sleep. Uh, Jesus uh, knows what it's like to, you know, uh, to, to, to experience the pains of, of a physical body just like you and I. So why is it important that Jesus is fully man? A few points that I wanna make you aware of. First of all, Jesus had to be a man to be our representative. Now, the Bible says that our first representative was Adam. He was our representative in the Garden of Eden. And of course, you know, Genesis 3, he messed up, he sinned, and the world was broken as a result. And so when Adam sinned against God through his disobedience, God counted you and me guilty as well. It's the doctrine of original sin. It's how we describe the nature of humanity's sinful condition because of Adam's sin. We don't sin, um, or we do sin because we are sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. That's a, that's a big distinction. You didn't become a sinner as a two-year-old when you were defiant to your mom and dad, and then you became a sinner. You inherited original sin, so you came out a sinner, And you sinned as a result of being 
a sinner. That's important for us to understand because then it really sets the stage for how depraved we really are, how wicked we really are, how we have no hope of, of, of knowing God or we have no hope of heaven. We have no hope of, of having peace in our life apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 directly says Adam is the first man. And then it says that Jesus is the second man. In Romans 5.12, it says, therefore sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all men sinned. So again, Adam was our representative in the garden. He disobeyed, he failed. God counted us guilty because of his failure. But in Romans 12, we see the effects of sin is death. Adam died. We all know that we have to experience death as well. That's a result of sin. But here's the good news. Romans 5.18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. So one trespass, that is Adam trespassed. He disobeyed and that led to the condemnation of all men. So one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. So the one act of righteousness, Jesus living a perfect life, dying on the cross because of his righteousness, he brings justification, forgiveness to us. That's huge. Jesus had to be a man, fully man, in order uh, for him to be our representative. He did what Adam could not and was unable to do. He obeyed God completely. Secondly, Jesus was a man to be our substitute. Jesus had to be a man to be our substitute. He, He had to be like us in order to take our place in death. If he was an angel, he wouldn't have been able to represent us. God wasn't concerned with saving angels. He was concerned with saving humanity. He wanted to save you. So he sent Jesus in the form of a man so that he could pay the penalty for our sin. And then thirdly, Jesus was a man to sympathize with our pain. So Hebrews 2 talks about this. He he experienced pain. He experienced loss. He experienced um, a disappointment betrayal, right? He was tempted just like you and I are tempted on every, in, in every way, and, and yet he remained sinless. So he's able to sympathize with us because he walked in our shoes. He, he experienced what we are experiencing. So Jesus had to be fully man, but Jesus also needed to be fully divine. He needed to be fully God. Verse 35, the angel said that he would be called holy, the son of God. Now, the title Son of God does not mean that he was a physical child of God. It directly means and shows us that he is, in fact, fully divine, that that he has the same nature of God. Maybe you've heard of the, the doctrine of the incarnation. That's what this teaches us. God comes in human flesh, right? We, we see this all over Scripture, see this, that God is uh, sending Jesus not only to be fully man, but he is fully God as well. Now, this distinguishes us from every other religion and belief system in the world. Uh, Mormons do not believe that Jesus was fully God. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that Jesus was fully God. Um, Hindus, Muslims, go down the list, do not believe that Jesus was fully God. They, they might say Jesus was a good man, but he was not fully divine. And so when someone says, oh, these religions are just basically the same, you know, it's all kind of the same stuff, you can say, no, that's actually not true. We're, we're the only ones that believe that Jesus was fully God as well as fully man. Here's a few examples of why we believe that. John chapter one, verse one speaks of Jesus, calls him the word. And John says, in the beginning was the word, was Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word, listen, was God. He was in the beginning with God. He is, he, Jesus has eternally existed. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. In John chapter 20, verse 27, you remember doubting Thomas. He gets a bad rap. I actually like Thomas. He didn't believe that Jesus rose from the grave and all of his buddies we're like, no, we, we saw him, he's alive. He's like, I'm not gonna believe until I see him face to face. And, and so one day Jesus shows up face to face and he was like, hey, I am alive. And Jesus tells him in verse 27 of 
John 20, he says, put your finger here, see my hands. He's he was saying, look at the scars, the nail prints in my hands. Look at the side where they thrust me with the spear. Look at, look at these scars. He said, do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. That was the perfect opportunity for Jesus to say, whoa, 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 I'm not God. I'm just a dude, you know, get off off your knees, don't worship me. But he doesn't, why? Why doesn't he? Because he was worthy to be called God. He was worthy of that worship from Thomas. Jesus calls himself the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek. Alphabet Omega is the last. So Jesus is saying, I have always existed. I am eternal. I am the beginning and I am the end in Revelation twenty two thirteen, 13. And in John 8, the biggest one, I think, Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Everyone at that time would have known he was referring to Yahweh, the Hebrew name of God. And so Jesus putting himself on the same level, claiming full, full not only manhood, but also divinity. Now, why is it important to understand that Jesus is fully God? A few points here. First of all, only God could bear the penalty of the sin of humanity. Only God could actually bear the weight and the penalty of sin. Can you imagine a, a person trying to live a perfect life? I mean, think of the best person you know. May, maybe, maybe it was your grandmother, the sweetest, you know, she loved the Lord, but even she had her flaws, right? She wasn't perfect. And, and can you imagine a, a person actually, you know, thinking that they could die for the rest of humanity? Of course not. Only God could provide that. Only God could, could bear the weight of that penalty. Only God, secondly, could earn our salvation. Is there really something that you could do to earn heaven? I mean, what could you possibly do to earn paradise? I mean, the Bible tells us there's no way you can do it. The Bible tells us that we've all failed, we've all messed up. And so when we think about a man being able to save himself by doing good work, it's just, it's just ridiculous when you think about it logically. But I run into so many people who are trying to do that. You know, when you think about God, you believe in God? Yeah, I think there's a God. You think there's a heaven? Yeah, there's probably a heaven. Well, what do you think it takes to go to heaven? Well, I think I've just got to live a, you know, just try to be a good person. Like, really? You're living on good person? You're living on what you thought about last night and that's going to get you? Yeah. You see, only God could earn that for us. If you could earn that, then you'd brag about yourself. And that's exactly what the Bible says cannot happen and could not happen. That's why Paul says we're saved by grace alone. But then thirdly, only God can satisfy his wrath against sin. A mere human being couldn't satisfy the wrath of God. I don't know, some people are like, oh, I don't know if we should talk about the wrath of God in church, Trent. Let's talk about loving people and let's bring it and unite it and love it. And it's like, I get it. We got, I want to talk about God's love, but we also don't want to neglect the other important truths of the scripture. So we have to understand that the wrath of God is a serious thing. Romans 1.18 says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The wrath of God is a very, very real, fearful thing that we should be aware of, that his wrath is against godlessness and wickedness in this world. And you either pay for your own sin or Jesus will pay for it for you. And apart from Christ, you will suffer the wrath of God for eternity. But because Jesus was fully God, his death qualified himself to satisfy God's wrath against sin. He took your place. That's the miracle. So, the most amazing miracle, in my opinion, of all time, greater than the creation of the universe, greater than the creation of humanity, by far the greatest and most amazing miracle of all time was the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we celebrate every December 25th, not some fat guy in a red suit. He just kind of distracts us from the real miracle. What we celebrate is not pre-lit trees that, yeah, they bring smiles to our face, what we celebrate this month is, is not the, the nice presents that we're going to receive. Sure, they're, they're great, but they're going to be destroyed by moth and rust. 
what we celebrate, listen, is the fact that the infinite God, omnipotent, all-powerful God, the eternal God of all creation joined himself to human nature, was born of a woman, lived on the earth with us and went to a sinner's cross to pay our salvation. Somebody get excited about that today. It's the miracle. It's the miracle. So no matter what traditions we enjoy this December, the gifts, the lights, the decorations, dinners with families, all of that is great, but it can also take your focus off of Jesus. You can remove every light, every tree, every present. You can remove every family tradition you love. You can have Christmas without all those traditions, but you can't celebrate Christmas without Jesus. And so I wanna close today by helping us experience and think about this as, as, as being a real Christmas experience. Like, I don't want you to miss it this year. Some of you continue to miss it year after year. You miss the whole point. You live for the traditions, but the traditions leave you hopeless. It's like a drug. You get excited adrenaline, and the day after Christmas, it's like the bottom falls out, and everybody's depressed, and it's raining and cold, and can't wait until the sun and spring again. You know, we just kind of suffer through January and February. We need more. We need substance, right? And the truth is you've been hurt. You've, you've lost people that you love. You, you've experienced some letdowns in your life. They're weighing you down today. And the result is sometimes we lose the point of Christmas. It just becomes this thing that we're just like, oh gosh, do I have to do this? We got to spend this money and do this and that. But Christmas, the real Christmas is that Jesus came into your world and he's waiting for you to now follow him. He's waiting for you to come to him. And so three quick points today. First of all, the real Christmas means that Jesus offers you forgiveness. Remember in Matthew 1, uh, the angel tells Joseph, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sin. And so the, the hope of Christmas, the real Christmas is that Jesus offers you forgiveness. He offers you the hope of forgiveness in restoring that relationship that is broken between you and God. Now, in our culture, in modern culture today, like people have a hard time admitting that they need to be saved. I mean, think about the men, especially that you know, like we don't wanna be saved by anybody because I got this, right? I want to save my family. I want to save the, 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 the company. I want to say, I want to be the hero. And so we don't feel like we need to be saved. We want to do the saving. But at the same time, we also know that we're not perfect. And so think about this. Like if I were to, you know, open up your journal and just say, hey, I want, if you have any regrets from, from your life, could you just write those down? You probably fill that page up pretty quickly. <laughs> I could probably say, hey, what are your regrets from 2023? Just write those down. That'd be a pretty quick page too. Why? Because we've all sinned. We've, we've messed up. We have past sin and we have present sin. We're gonna have future sin and that sin has separated us from God. And here's the reality. All sin separates us from relationships. It breaks things. Sin breaks things. Um, here's a short example. I'll, I'll confess something. So this past couple of weeks ago, my wife was so excited because she finished her Christmas list and she shared the Christmas list with me. And she's like, oh, I just shared my list with you. My girls were in the room. Um, I've got three girls. They were in the room with us. And I, I was a little frustrated about some other things going on in my life. So give me a little grace on this. But I didn't respond quite enthusiastically like one would hope. And so I said, honey, could you, could you just buy the gifts yourself and just put them under the tree and just help a brother out? I know. Pray for your pastor. He needs help. <laughs> Pray for the other men in the room too because y'all think the same thing as me. <laughs> You're just not as dumb as me to say it out loud. As soon as I said it, I was like, no, 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 no. Come back, come back. My girls immediately, oh, dad, that was so rude. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not mean that. I I'm just frustrated about it. I'm sorry, honey, that's not what I meant. I cannot wait to click all these links and to buy all the things that you want. <laughs> it's gonna be fantastic. Merry Christmas. 
No, seriously, I had to apologize. I had to say, I am sorry. That was not very considerate. That was dumb. And I'm sorry, this is really gonna be good, right? You see what happens in relationships every time we sin and offend someone, there's a gap between us and that person. So if you're married or you're in a relationship, like you offend somebody, that gap is there. And if you don't deal with it, if you don't say, I'm sorry, if you don't own that and admit that, then tomorrow you're gonna say something else or do something else. And then the gap is gonna get a little bit wider. And if you don't own that and deal with that, then the gap is gonna get a little bit wider and a little bit wider. And over years, if you're not practicing you know, humility and, hey, I'm sorry and, 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 and forgiving each other, you're gonna feel this big gap between the two of you and you're gonna be like, oh, we fell out of love and we just don't love each other. It's like, no, you're just prideful and sinful and you don't say, I'm sorry. You don't practice forgiveness. You see, sin breaks things. And so that's a simple, silly example of how it breaks our relationships with each other. But when you come into the world, a sinner, you have this great chasm between you and a holy God. And that sin separates you. And the wrath of God is upon you until the intermediary, the representative, Jesus, comes into play in your life and you receive him by faith. Then that forgiveness is given and now your relationship with your creator can be restored and you can have the hope of heaven, but not before. See, we've all sinned. And the beauty of Christmas is that we have this great news that God allows Jesus to be our representative on the cross and take upon our sin as he hung and as he died and, and he rose from the grave so that you and I could not only be forgiven, but so that he could prove that he is more powerful than sin and death and that he does in fact provide life everlasting. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, that's the real Christmas. By sending Jesus, both fully man and fully God, we can have our sins forgiven. That's what he offers us. But secondly, Jesus also offers you the gift of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? When you come to faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God dwells within your soul. It's amazing to experience the, 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 the creator of the universe living inside of your soul. It changes everything. What that means is you're never alone. You might feel alone today, but with the gift of the Holy Spirit, he is with you today. What this means is that God's Spirit comforts you in times of trouble. What this means is that God's spirit guides you when you're trying to make important decisions. What this means is God's spirit encourages you when you're suffering and when you're hurting. What this means is that the Holy Spirit opens up your, your mind to new truth. He, he opens up your spirit to be aware of more spiritual depth. Even right now, God might be opening up some of your hearts and minds to the truth of the gospel today. Jesus promised that he was gonna give us life and life more abundantly or life to the full. And what I find is that so many people don't believe that. They think, no, Jesus isn't gonna give me life. Jesus is gonna rob me of life. If I follow him, it's not gonna be fun. Life is gonna stink. I wanna have fun. Following God is not fun. I gotta hear that all the time. And it's, it's like, think about this. If my kids, if they're little and they come to me and they say, dad, I wanna live a good life. I wanna live a righteous life. I wanna do what you tell me to do. Would my response be fantastic? Been waiting for this day. Go shovel manure. I'm selling your toys. Of course not. It's weird. Like I would be like, oh my, let me show you. Yes, this is the most incredible thing for you. I'm gonna... I'm gonna warn you, there's gonna be some things that look like they're gonna be fun and it looks like it's gonna you know, provide fun and, 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 and peace in your life, but it's a trick, it's a trap. You're gonna be left broken and hopeless. You're gonna be alone and afraid and don't walk that path. This is the path that's gonna lead to life. I would want them to experience life. It's the same for Jesus. Let me remind you in Luke 2, the angel 
told the shepherds, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. He didn't say I'm bringing you bad news of great suffering. No, it is good news of great joy. The real story of Christmas is that when we give our life to Jesus by faith, he gives us true life and meaning through the power of the Holy Spirit living within us. Thirdly and finally, the real Christmas means that Jesus offers you peace. Jesus offers you peace. In Romans chapter five, it says, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What this means is without faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, we have no peace with God. That great chasm between us is still there. There's no way to find find God and hope in, in anything else apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the real Christmas. The real Christmas is that Jesus offers you peace. This is what it's all about. The faith and the peace that comes from knowing Jesus that fills you. God will justify you by faith in Christ alone. That word justify just simply means Okay, I'm in a court, right? I know I'm guilty, but the judge looks at me and declares me not guilty. He justifies me. It's like Jesus is in the courtroom and he's like, no, I covered him, I got him, he's forgiven. He's been declared righteous, even though I know that I'm not. He was my representative on the cross and so I'm justified, I'm made right with God. A few years back, I was out in the garage doing a little cleanup and this bird flew into the garage and couldn't find its way out. I guess the car was kind of there and I don't know, couldn't see it. And, but he frantically tried to find freedom. And so he saw the window and just started pounding into the window and flapping, you know, crazily, just kind of banging his little bird brain on the window. and. So I was like, oh my gosh, come on, man. <clears throat> so I go get a baseball glove that was there in the garage and I get a broom and kind of like John Candy in that one movie with the bat. I don't know if you remember that, great outdoors, but I felt like that. So I'm going over there trying not to get rabies and, and uh, you know, I'm trying to shoo it and it's afraid of me. And so it just keeps flapping against the window and against the corner and, and just not, not getting it, you know? And so I'm still trying to shoo and still trying to do the deal. And then finally it just kind of turned and, it's like attacked me, I think. It was attacking me. And uh, I was just like, if I'm going down, I'm taking you with me kind of feel. But so he starts coming at me and I kind of give the little, you know, kind of shooing motion with the everything that I got and, and kind of nudged it a little bit. And, and then that put it in the right direction and he, he found an opening and out he went, right? And whew, finally, like, geez, glad you finally found it. And I always think about that story because... In so many ways, it's, it's, it's funny that before the bird found freedom, he was bashing its head against the wall and the window, trying to find freedom on his own and just, you know, not able to escape that prison. It seemed like the harder it struggled on its own strength, the more it hurt himself. Let me say that again. Some of you need to hear this the harder he struggled and fought in his own strength, the more he hurt himself. And it took someone on the outside, a little bit bigger and stronger and wiser to come into his life and and, and shoo him in the right direction. And then eventually helped him find the freedom that he was longing for. Helped him experience the world that he was really created to experience. I think in this room, there are some people who have been trying to find peace and happiness in their life, but they're doing it in their own strength. You've been trying all kinds of things and you're just, you're just frustrated and you feel empty and you feel like you don't have direction. And and I I would suggest to you that most likely the reason perhaps, is that you've never given your life to Jesus. You've tried to celebrate Christmas with all the traditions and it just continues to leave you kind of hopeless and 
and uh, just, just kind of not fulfilled because you, you can't really experience Christmas without Jesus. And so today, I, I wonder if there's some people in the room that need to commit their life to Him today. So I'm gonna invite you to bow your head and, and let's go to the Lord in prayer just all over the room, everywhere in Knoxville. Let's just bow our heads. And if you've never committed your life to Jesus, you've never put your faith in Jesus, remembering what we've talked about today, you were born a sinner, broken. You, you haven't always believed. You haven't always been a Christian. Like there's, there's gotta be a moment in your life that you look back on and say, yeah, that's the day that I committed my life to Jesus. That's, that's what the New Testament teaches us. And so if you've never had that moment. You can just simply use this as that first conversation with God. Just, just tell him, just say, God, I confess that I'm a sinner. God, I believe that Jesus is your son, that he died on the cross for my sin and that he rose from the grave. Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me. I commit my life to you. Thank you for Christmas and the gift of salvation. All over the room here in Maryville and Knoxville, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Pastor Taylor to take over the room in Knoxville for just a moment and with every head bowed here, just wonder who here in the room would say, you know what, Trent? I just prayed that prayer for the first time. If that was you, would you slip up your hand so I can see it? Can I see it? Anybody in the room all over? Praise God. Praise God, young man, young woman. C2, anybody else? Anybody else? I just prayed that prayer. It's all too. Here's what I want to ask. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. Everybody, I'm going to ask to stand up. As we stand up, if you made that decision, I want to encourage you to walk this way. Everybody can look this way at me now and walk towards this room. Our section leaders are back here. They're going to walk. Wave your hand, guys. Come out here so everybody can see you on the far left. <laughs> They're gonna, they're gonna take you to the care and prayer room. We've got some resources we wanna give to you and just celebrate with you because this is the greatest decision you've ever made. Church, can we celebrate with these folks? Praise God. I know we had at least four or five people in the first service and trusting that some of you maybe didn't raise your hand, but, but you did pray that prayer. And at any moment as we worship as we kind of respond to what we just heard. That's what the ending is. It's responding to what we just were taught, responding to the gospel. So stick with it, sing, respond to God and worship. And as we sing, if you made that decision, you can make your way this way. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the decisions that were made. Thank you for the life that is Jesus. Thank you for sending him and we celebrate that this season, God. It is all about Him. It is for Him. We want to put our attention on Him. We want to thank You for Him. We want to sing to You for the gift that we have received in Jesus. And I pray for those that just made decisions, God, encourage them and bless them and change their life today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship together. Thank you so much for watching this video. We'd love for you to like this video and leave a comment. We'd also like to encourage you to subscribe and click the bell so you never miss an upload from Foothills Church. To learn more about FC, you can go to our website, foothillschurch.com, or by clicking the link in the description below.